Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Echo Live. Happy Friday, everyone. My name is Anna, and I'm coming to you from the Michigan Science Center's Echo Distance Learning Program. Uh, today, we have another really exciting, really fun science program for you, um, just to close out our week of Echo Live. Um, so if you haven't done so already, go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat feature, either on Zoom or through Facebook Live. That chat feature is going to be your way to communicate with me um, to answer all of my questions that I have about today's experiments, um, but also you can use it to ask me questions that you might have. Um, so we've been doing a lot of really awesome science here on Echo Live, um, and today I thought it would be fun to bring you another round of experiments that you can and you should try at home. Um, so hi everybody in the chat, thank you so much for introducing yourself. Um, you can feel free to tell us your name, what grade you're in, uh, maybe your favorite science topic. Uh, go ahead and note that in there. And we are going to get started with today's lesson. Um, so we bring you these programs every day at 2.30 p.m. So I should say before we get started um, that we've heard your answers. Um, we've closed our poll. Um, we heard your messages through chat. We got your messages on Facebook. We got your emails. Um, and we've decided to keep hosting our programs on Apple Live at 2.30 p.m. Eastern every single weekday. Um, so we're not going to be changing the time of Echo Live. Um, we'll keep bringing them to you at 2.30 p.m. Eastern. If you do prefer to watch in the morning, don't worry. The videos are going to stay up on the Michigan Science Center's Facebook page, and they'll also be uploaded to our YouTube channel um, for you to watch them later. If you do have any questions about them, you can definitely still let us know. Send us a message on Facebook. Send us a message um, through YouTube. Send us an email, um, and we would still be happy to answer your questions. Now, you might be wondering what's up with my virtual background today and why I have um, some different props here on my desk than we normally might. Um, and today we're going to be talking about rad reactions. And the best way I could find to tie all these things together um, is actually by talking about the science behind lava lamps. Um, so if you have a lava lamp at home, um, you are one of my favorite people. Just fun fact about me, nothing really to do with science, but I actually collect them. I have almost 30 lava lamps in my collection. I think they're really cool, really fun to look at, um, but they also have a lot of very interesting science behind them. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that science here before we start our hands-on demonstrations that you can try at home. Um, so I brought out two of my lava lamps. Um, one of them has a wax base um, suspended in water, this one right here. Um, and this one has um, some glitter suspended in the water inside. Um, so if we zoom in on our lava lamps here, we can see that the liquid inside is starting to move, at least in our glitter lamp here. Now the wax one takes a little bit longer to warm up. I maybe didn't plug that one in in enough time today, but we can see that even without touching this glitter lava lamp, we're seeing lots of motion inside. Um, lava lamps rely on something called convection um, in order to kind of get that cool, um, globby and sometimes glittery effect going on inside. So. Um, we say that in chemistry and in physics that um, as things start to warm up, those things start to rise. So at the base of a lava lamp, there is a, a lamp um, that's providing a source of heat. It then starts to warm up the water, um, or in the pink one, it would start to warm up the wax, and it then travels up because we say that warm things will rise. Um, after that, warm water or warm wax rises up to the top of the lava lamp, it then cools down and falls back. Um, so we can actually see that happening right here inside the glitter lamp. Um, as the glitter warms, it rises to the top. As that water gets further from the heat source, it cools back down and then falls back to the bottom. Um, so this process happens over and over and over again. The really awesome things of, thing about wax lava lamps is that no matter how many times this wax heats up, cools down, heats up, cools down, heats up, cools down, and mixes in with that water, they'll never actually mix together. The wax will never actually dissolve. Um, and that's because wax is what we call hydrophobic. So we're gonna be talking a good deal about hydrophobic substances during our lesson today. Um, so if you know what hydrophobic means, um, go ahead and tell me in the chat. Do you have any idea what hydrophobic might mean? Go ahead, think about that. Um, while you think about it and perhaps type your answer if you already know it, let's break that word into two pieces. The first part of that word is hydro, right? So probably referring to water. Um, so first part of the word hydro referring to water and the second part of the word is phobia. 
Um, and if you know what a phobia is, maybe that will help you figure out the answer to this question. So something that is hydrophobic or has a phobia of water. I see a lot of really great answers. I have some friends on Facebook Live are telling me that it repels water or that it can't dissolve in water. So something that is hydrophobic um, or has a phobia of water, we say is scared of water, right? It doesn't want to touch it. Um, so wax is one of those hydrophobic substances. Um, wax, um, just like most oils and fats, are hydrophobic. They won't want to mix with the water. They want to stay completely separate. Um, that's the principle that keeps the wax separate from the water. So even once you turn your lava lamp back off, um, those wax particles will actually stick back together um, and they'll never mix in with the liquid. Now, um, if you've ever owned a lava lamp, you know that we are never supposed to shake them, right? We're never supposed to shake up a lava lamp, especially while it's warm. Um, and that's because if you did that, right, you could break the wax up into really, really small particles. And since all of those particles are hydrophobic, afraid of water, they'll have a hard time reconnecting with each other. They'll have a hard time pushing back through the water um, in order to rejoin the rest of the wax. So you should never shake up your lava lamp. Um, and that's the last um, lecture about lava lamps I promise I'll give you. So we're gonna be making our own lava lamp for our first experiment that you can and you should try at home. Um, so I've set up the materials right here on this tray. And we're going to rely um, on a few different factors, things that we've talked about on Echo Live so far, in order to create this lava lamp. So before the program, I filled um, this empty plastic bottle up about three quarters of the way with vegetable oil. Um, so any sort of oil will work for this experiment. We like to use vegetable oil because it's almost clear. Um, but if you have something like canola oil or another kind of oil in your house, um, that will do the same thing. So this oil, we say, is hydrophobic. Um, so if you know what hydrophobic means now, since we've talked about that a little, a lot of really great answers in the chat, what's going to happen if I pour this water inside the bottle? So this is water that I've just dyed blue um, with some food coloring so that, our, um, so that we'll be able to see it a little bit better. Um, are they going to mix or are they going to stay separate? Tell me in the chat. Um, you could even, if you wanna give me a thumbs up to say they'll mix, or a smiley face to say they'll stay separate. Go ahead and tell me somehow what you think. I'm seeing some reactions starting to flow in. I think, think about our oil and our water. If oil is afraid of water, are they going to mix or will they stay separate? Yeah, I see Libby. And Alicia starting to tell us a couple of their hypotheses about what could happen when I mix these two substances together. Um, Melanie and Teresa have both told me that they think it's going to stay separate. Um, Kat agrees. I see that Elise in our Zoom chat gave me a smiley face saying that she thinks they're also going to stay separate. They won't mix. Um, so we've got a really, we've got a lot of great hypotheses based on what we've talked about so far. So let's go ahead and we'll pour in enough water to almost fill our water bottle. Now we see some droplets, but once I'm done pouring in this cup of water, we'll let this, um, we'll let the bottle settle. Um, so we do see some bubbles, but it, the longer we leave it, right, we notice that our two substances have completely separated within seconds. The oil and the water have separated themselves. They don't want to be touching each other, um, so they create that barrier between them. Um, so we have our hydrophobic oil floating on top and our water, um, which is obviously hydrophilic because water loves water, um, like likes to be inside like or like dissolves like, as we say in chemistry. Um, and so we've got our oil on top and our water on bottom. Um, if you can think about molecules, right, we know that the water sinks to the bottom because it is heavier or more dense than the vegetable oil. So even though I had more vegetable oil than water, the overall density of the water is much greater. So water has much more, has many more molecules packed in the amount of space that it fills than the oil does. So it's always going to sink to the bottom. Now I could put the cap on and I could give us, give our bottle a little bit of a shake and we'll notice that even if I shook it up, right, 
those molecules are going to settle right back to their original configuration. The water is always going to sink back down because it is much more dense than the oil and they do not want to mix together. Now you might be wondering though, how are we going to turn this into a lava lamp? That was the point of this experiment, right? Um, so it doesn't make much of a lava lamp since the oil and water want to stay completely separate from each other. If we want the water to be able to travel up through the oil, unlike we would see in a regular lava lamp, right, we have to add another ingredient. Um, in order to create bubbles or in order to trap that liquid um, and pull it up through the oil, we're actually going to use Alka-Seltzer. Um, so if you've been watching Echo Live from the beginning, you know we love Alka-Seltzer. We use it all the time here on Echo Live. Um, so if you haven't yet bought stocks in Alka-Seltzer, you might want to do so um, since we use it so often here. Just kidding. But we're going to go ahead and we'll add the Alka-Seltzer in. If you remember back to when we used this to launch rockets, right, you know that Alka-Seltzer, um, when it dissolves in water, starts to form carbon dioxide gas. Um, gas is going to be much lighter or much less dense, right, than the water or the oil. Um, and so it's actually going to travel up. And so we will try, we'll break our Alka-Seltzer in half so it's small enough to fit through the top of the bottle. And then we'll just drop it down all the way inside and watch as it sinks down into the water and those bubbles start to form. Now, as our Alka-Seltzer starts to fizz, right, um, it carries up some of that blue food coloring in the droplets um, as it rises up, but then they sink right back down, right? So the gas will kind of grab onto some of that water. It carries it up, um, but since water is much more dense, those droplets of water that are carried up our tube will eventually sink back down. So instead of relying on convection for, to make this lava lamp like we do in the regular lava lamps, for this one, we're relying on density and that property of oil and water that keeps them separate from each other. Um, so once our Alka-Seltzer runs out, um, our lava lamp can be used again later. Um, so once our Alka-Seltzer runs out, um, the CO2 gas will escape out through the top of the bottle. The oil and water will eventually resettle to their original um, orientation, and then you can keep it so that you can try this again later. So um, very, very easy science experiment that you can try at home. You can try experimenting with different um, types of oils. You could try different temperatures of water. Um, if you do try any of these experiments at home, make sure you post about them. Um, tag us on Facebook, tag us on Instagram, um, and tell us how your experiment went. Um, maybe if you have a really interesting result, we can share it here on Echo Live. Um, someone asked, where can you get the last ingredient, which was Alka-Seltzer, and you can buy this almost anywhere, anywhere that has um, a health department. So um, you can get it at the grocery store in the section where you would find maybe pain relievers or um, digestive supplements. Um, you can get it at a pharmacy, um, a CVS, anything like that. So you can find Alka-Seltzer almost anywhere, and it doesn't have to be Alka-Seltzer brand. It just has to be an antacid tablet. Um, so we'll go ahead and we'll seal up our lava lamp and we'll keep that one just off to the side for later. So we're also going to do another experiment um, combining this into a different type of reaction. So I've set this one up over to the side, but first let's talk a little bit more about what makes something um, hydrophobic or what makes something hydrophobic and hydrophilic. So there are two different types of um, arrangements for molecules. We say that they can either be polar or they can be nonpolar, meaning they are directional or non-directional. Um, you can think of polar things like magnets. Um, so this is a molecule of dish soap. Um, so this really great drawing um, comes from Nature on the Shelf and they have this really awesome drawing of what a soap molecule will look like. What makes soap so special is it's what we call an emulsifier. Um, that means that it's not like water and it's not like oil, it's kind of a combination of the two. Water, we say, is polar. Uh, it is directional like a magnet. It has a positive and a negative end of, this, um, of a water molecule. So on a molecule of soap, it has a polar head. This green region right here is polar like water, but the tail, this long region of the molecule, is nonpolar. Um, so that part is the hydrophobic tail. So while the green part of this soap molecule um, loves water, likes to be near it, wants to bond to water, the tail doesn't like it at all. The tail is hydrophobic, it's afraid of water, 
Um, and so when soap or when soap molecules arrange themselves, we say they arrange themselves um, in these groups that we call micelles. Um, so the micelles will actually clump together when they're dissolved in water to arrange themselves in this structure. So they'll point all of their hydrophilic, meaning the parts that like water, towards the outside, and they'll shove all of their hydrophobic tails towards the center. So they form kind of a group like this so that the entire outside of the droplet is okay with touching the water, it likes it, and then it will trap all the oily substances on the inside. Um, so we're gonna do an experiment um, using um, something else that is hydrophobic. So not wax, um, but we're actually going to be talking about fats, which are also part of that oil family. And so we'll be using milk for this experiment. So milk is another one of those substances that is hydrophobic. Um, since it has fats or oils inside it, it does not like to touch water. So you may have seen this one before. Um, this is another experiment that you can try at home. So we'll switch my camera over here and then I'll turn off my virtual background so it doesn't look so funny. And um, over here on the side of the screen, I just have um, a shallow container full of milk. Um, so milk, we said, is hydrophobic. It does not like water. Um, the next thing we're going to add is some food coloring. Um, food coloring is water-based, meaning that it is hydrophilic. Um, it will like water. Um, so if we drop our food coloring in very carefully here to our milk, you'll notice that it doesn't do a whole lot of dissolving around. Now, this is 2% milk. Um, this was the only milk that I could get at the grocery store today. Um, ooh, a little bit sloppy on that one. Um, but you'll notice for the most part that these drops of water-based food coloring stay pretty separate. They don't immediately start to spread or dissolve into the milk because the milk is resisting it. It doesn't want to be near the water since it is hydrophobic. We said that soap is a good emulsifier, meaning it's able to kind of disrupt these bonds. Um, it's able to kind of force these uh, two substances to mix together by forming those micelles, by forming those groups of molecules with the hydrophilic heads pointing towards the water and the hydrophobic tails um, pointing towards the milk. Um, so what we're going to use for this is that Dawn dish soap. So we've talked about soap um, and how it is one of those emulsifiers able to form those micelles. Um, so before we add the soap, we'll just go ahead and I'll show you what happens if we were to dip just a plain Q-tip into the water. And you'll see that nothing really happens. We see a little bit of movement, but not much mixture um, between our substances in the bowl. Now let's repeat that, but this time I'll dip my cotton swab in some dish soap. And so we've got dish soap on the cotton swab this time and let's introduce it into the reaction. We can see that wherever we put the soap, right now we start to see those mixtures, um, or we start to see that food coloring start to mix together. Um, so we call this almost like a milk explosion, right? As that emulsifier, that soap, caused the oil and water or the fat and water to start to mix together by forming those micelles. Um, so something we've heard a lot about over the last few weeks is how important it is to wash your hands. Um, and this goes right back to that topic of hydrophobic and hydrophilic substances. The reason it's so important to wash your hands is because of this exact reason that we just saw in the soap. Thanks to these micelles, um, we're actually able to interrupt the bonds that are part of viruses and bacteria. Um, so we have a really great diagram of that um, that I found from the New York Times. Um, and in this diagram, it shows how the hydrophobic heads and hydrophilic tails of these soap molecules. So over here on the left, we have a diagram of a virus. And viruses have a fatty membrane around the outside. So this orange and red membrane is made out of fats. Um, so if you think about the hydrophobic head and hydrophilic tail, um, they're actually able to penetrate this layer. So since these soap molecules want to arrange themselves into these micelles, they'll actually start to interrupt the bonds that hold together the membranes of bacteria and viruses. As they do this, they actually break them into tiny little pieces, and then those soap molecules will surround them. Um, so these blue molecules, those are soap molecules surrounding bits and pieces of that virus. 
Um, so they actually trap them inside. So as you wash your hands, right, you want to really make sure you're disrupting as many of those bonds um, between the membranes on the virus that could be on your hand, viruses and bacteria both have this membrane. Um, it breaks them up into tiny pieces and then the soap will carry it down the drain. Um, so this is why it's so important to wash your hands using soap, right? So even though hand sanitizer and wipes can be a really good alternative if you don't have access to a sink and water with soap, um, this is why soap works the best because soap can actually break apart those viruses and bacteria um, and carry those pieces away safely wrapped up in a shell of soap. Um, so really, really interesting. Um, let's see if you guys have any questions. I have a couple more experiments to show us talking about these, um, pr these different types of molecules and how they react. Um, but go ahead and type your questions in the chat now. Um, while you think about your questions, send them to you or send them to me. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, of course, at this time, we're going to thank the sponsors of the Michigan Science Center. Um, so thank everyone for donating to the Michigan Science Center, people like you who are making donations on their own to the Science Center um, over our website or through the link that we've provided in some of our programs. Um, and big thanks to our major donors like the DT Energy Foundation. Um, we love bringing these programs to you every weekday at 2.30 p.m. Um, and the only reason we're able to do that for free is thanks to our donors. So thank you everyone and thank you DTE. Let's check to see if we got any questions. Um, Brenda asked, is this dish soap? It is dish soap. Um, and the best brand of dish soap to use is Dawn dish soap. Um, it just has the best kind of structure made for it. Um, it's also biodegradable. Um, and so you don't have to worry about it going down your drain um, or anything like that. Um, so we use Dawn dish soap for this. Um, because that acts as the emulsifier. It is able to interrupt those bond or the barriers between hydrophobic and hydrophilic substances by forming those micelles, those groups of cells surrounded by soap. Oh, someone pointed out, thank you for pointing this out. I wouldn't have even noticed. Someone pointed out that my wax lava lamp is starting to go. It's still just getting started here, um, but we can see that that wax is starting to expand and it's also starting to um, rise, right? So in my pink one here, um, now that wax is getting warmer. And as it gets warmer, it rises up the tube. Um, once it reaches the top, it'll cool back down and fall. So um, lava lamps normally take about two or three hours to really get cycling around um, just because of how thick and how dense the wax is inside them. Um, the glitter one starts up in just a few minutes because there's not a lot of density. Um, the glitter molecules are much more spread apart. Um, and so it's really easy to get that convection current going inside the glitter lamp. Um, Delilah asks, what are the lamps called? These are called lava lamps. You can get them um, from a lot of places. I find them a lot at places like Target, um, or I find them most often, almost my entire collection has been collected from garage sales. Uh, so maybe once garage sales are back in season, maybe later this summer, um, keep an eye out for a lava lamp. You can get one of your own um, or let me know um, and you can give it to me because I love them so much. Um, so someone asked, how did the dye in the food coloring not mix in the milk? Um, so we didn't really cause them to milk, but what or uh, mix together. So let's switch my camera back over and we'll talk about that question. Um, since we only touched the very surface of the milk, right? That um, those micelles kind of rushed across the surface here. Um, food coloring is water soluble, meaning that we would need to add um, a lot more soap if we really wanted the food coloring to mix into the milk altogether. We'd really need to make sure that all of the milk is coming in contact with um, the dish soap so that it's able to form even more of those micelles um, and really get the entire mixture to mix together. You can see that we've had a little bit um, of the color spreading into the milk, but only we only used um, a tiny, tiny little small amount of dish soap to do this. Um, so with this small amount of dish soap, we only see a very small amount of mixture between the two substances. If we wanted more, we would just need to add more of our emulsifier. Great question. I'm gonna ask how many lava lamps do I have? And Kim answered that, I have almost 30 lava lamps. Oh, and I see another great question or comment from Delilah that says that she's done this experiment with pepper. Um, so I did bring that one to show you as well. And so we'll try that experiment next. Um, so if you don't have milk, especially um, if you don't have milk that's pretty fatty, like whole milk or 2%, um, you can recreate this experiment um, using water and pepper. 
Um, now, pepper is another one of those substances that is hydrophobic, but since um, pepper flakes are so light, um, they can actually float on the surface of the water. Um, just like we talked about with density, they're much less dense than the water. Let me get a lot of pepper here. There we go. So we'll cover a whole surface and thanks to surface tension, um, the really, really light particles of pepper are able to stay floating on the top, almost like spiders that are able to walk on water thanks to um, surface tension. Um, so surface tension is all due to the fact that water molecules really want to stick together, right? We talked about that they are polar, um, they act like magnets, and so they really like to stick together, um, which kind of forms that barrier keeping the pepper floating on top. Um, but since our emulsifier, the soap, is able to interrupt the bonds between the um, water, we can actually do the same experiment. So this time we'll take our dish soap on our Q-tip and we'll just dip it right in the center of all of our pepper flakes and watch what happens. They immediately repel away, right? So um, our pepper, some of it actually sank down to the bottom as we did that, um, and the rest of it repelled away as we interrupted those bonds between the water molecules on the surface. Um, so we couldn't rely as much on the surface tension. The soap um, actually rushed to spread out across the top um, surrounding all the water and which caused it kind of pushed the pepper out of the way as it went. And you can see it only took a very, very tiny, tiny little drop of soap to do so. So another really um, fun and exciting experiment that you can try at home. Hmm. So someone asked, does any kind of soap work? Um, yes, any sort of liquid soap will work for these experiments. Um, Dawn dish soap works best, but again, when you're trying experiments, right, you should always be practicing how you can change your variables. Um, you should only change one variable at a time, so you can recreate these experiments and try a different brand of dish soap. You can experiment with temperature, you can experiment with using things besides water or besides milk, and see what kind of results that you get. Um, so Libby did ask, can you use other liquids? Yes, try using other liquids. Um, she suggested orange juice. That sounds like a really, really interesting way to try this experiment. All right, um, so I have one more experiment to try with you. Um, and it also has to do a little bit with surface tension. Now, this one is super fun. It's one of my favorite experiments of all time or a variation on it at least. Um, and this is one that you can easily recreate at home um, but you have to promise me that if you do this one at home, you will do it outside only. Um, I'm going to do it here inside the studio, which is why I've um, changed a couple variations of this really popular experiment. Um, so give me a thumbs up in the comment section if you've heard of Diet Coke and Mentos. Um, so tell me if you've heard of Diet Coke and Mentos before. Give me a thumbs up, give me a heart, give me any reaction you want. Let me know that you've heard of this reaction. Um, and I'm going to get out my materials for our very last experiment of the day. Seeing those thumbs up, those hearts coming in. Um, so people are pretty familiar with this last reaction. It's one that's really, really fun. But if you've seen Diet Coke and Mentos before, you know that it makes a huge mess. Um, so what happens when you mix Diet Coke and Mentos is that Mentos are covered in tiny little microscopic pores. Um, when we talk about them in chemistry, we can also refer to them as nucleation sites. Um, if you think about our Alka-Seltzer, the gas we created when we dissolved Alka-Seltzer in water was carbon dioxide. Um, and soda is super saturated with carbon dioxide gas. Um, so the reason that Coke um, or other products make this noise when you open them, right, is because there's so much carbon dioxide stored inside this liquid. It's saturated. It really can't hold anything else. It can't hold any more of that carbon dioxide gas. Um, it's what makes it taste so good, but it's also what makes it pretty bad for your teeth. So um, even though this is Diet Coke and it doesn't have any um, real sugar in it, it has an artificial sweetener inside it, um, it's still really bad for your teeth because of that carbonic acid that's created when the carbon dioxide is suspended in a liquid. Um, so always brush your teeth if you do choose to drink soda. Um, and today we're going to be doing a variation. Um, so instead of using Mentos, we're going to use another really porous substance. Um, this is something that you probably have at home. So even if you don't have Mentos, you probably have just some regular old iodized table salt. Um, so instead of using Mentos, we're going to pour this table salt into our Coke. Um, what's going to happen when we do this is because there's so much surface area on every single grain of salt, it's going to latch on to the carbon dioxide bubbles inside the Coke 
um, and it's going to help them to escape much more rapidly than they would on their own. It's also able to interrupt the bonds um, between the water that's inside Coke. So there is some amount of water in here, um, even though we refer to it as soda, but there is water um, helping to suspend those carbon dioxide bubbles. Um, the salt is going to interrupt those bonds. The bubbles will latch onto the salt molecules and it will carry them out the top. Um, someone asked if this is still going to taste good after, and the answer is no. Um, we're going to add a pretty good deal of salt. Um, and so after this experiment, this Coke is going to taste really, really bad. And um, we'd have a hard time drinking it anyway, um, and you will find out why. So we'll go ahead and we'll put my funnel right here on top. Um, if you've seen this before, you know it happens pretty quickly. Um, so keep your eyes peeled. We're adding our salt to our Diet Coke in three, two, one. That carbon dioxide is being rapidly released from our Diet Coke. Um, thankfully, not as violent of a reaction as when it goes with Mentos. Um, but if you do ever try this experiment, either this version or the Mentos, you should only ever do it outside. Um, this is, again, all thanks to the interference of molecules um, surrounding water and surrounding surface tension. Um, someone asked, could you do this with anything other than Coke? Um, it has to be a diet cola of some sort. Um, so diet works best. Um, it's because of that artificial sweetener um, that you don't have sugar really interfering with the bonds here. Um, and so you want to use some sort of diet cola. Uh, I'm not sure that it would work really well with um, uh, lemon lime sodas or other things, um, but if you do give it a try, maybe start small. Start with one of the convenient store size bottles. Um, try it out, see what happens. If you get good results, you can always scale it up and go larger with a bigger bottle like this. So um, try it out. If you don't have Diet Coke, um, try something else and see if that works. Um, all right, so that is just about all the time we have. Um, this is our last Echo Live for the week. If you are looking for some at-home science experiments to try um, your, at your house this weekend, um, check out the Michigan Science Center's website. Um, it's written on the bottom of the slide here. So if you're looking for instructions on how to recreate these experiments or find some other ones that you can do um, inside or outside this weekend while the weather is so nice and so beautiful, um, go ahead and visit our website that's listed right here. Um, if you enjoy our videos, please share this with your Facebook friends. Make sure you like and share the Michigan Science Center's Facebook page. And we will see you all on Monday at 2.30 p.m. Eastern. Have a great weekend, everybody. We hope to see you on Monday.